Whilst we might not always agree on everything, I'm sure if you're around here, one thing that we will agree on is that all PCs are really fun. And, by extension, maybe building things so that you can have more fun with them. Yeah, we totally build our own hardware, so, well, we're gonna make something to adapt gamepads. Well, hello everyone, I'm High Treason, and today we're going to look at hooking a Mega Drive controller up to an old PC. I'm gonna build a circuit to do it, I'm gonna walk you through what the circuit does. It's my design, but it's simple enough that someone in history probably built something near identical, if not pretty much identical. Uh, there's not as much to it as you might think, so there's just a, a few sort of hurdles you need to get past. They're not really as complicated as they might appear uh, at first, so yeah, I guess we'll do that, because it's a pretty neat thing. Uh, Sega made good controllers, generally, and... Well, it's nice to be able to use one with a PC. Obviously we'll go over the history of the, the interface a little bit as well, because, well, I, I just feel like we should. For years, the 15-pin game port was quite abundant on the PC, but in some ways it's actually quite unusual, and it certainly wasn't common early on. If we turn back the clock to the end of the 1970s, numerous games consoles and computers had a means to connect a game controller of some sort, but there was no real standard for doing this and no real effort to make one. Several systems either had their controllers hardwired or part of the system itself even. Arcade machines certainly did this as, well, you didn't want patrons running off with the controller. By the turn of the decade, the Atari 2600's 9-pin controller ports had become a kind of unofficial norm, been used on Commodore machines and a few others. Whilst the Atari supported few analog controllers, technically the interface was oriented at digital ones and would live on for a surprisingly long time. The Atari control port supported two axes, or at least it supported four directions anyway. Uh, each direction on the stick used its own pin on the port, it's basically just four buttons. There was a pin for a single trigger button, and also two analog axes for the paddle controller. So, well, that's four digital directions, one button, two analog axes, five volt power and ground. This uses all nine pins. Somewhere around here, IBM introduced the PC. This wasn't really a video game platform, not first and foremost, and it was primarily a business machine. Most of the earliest PCs would have been sat there running SuperCalc all day, without really having time for silly games, unless the boss wasn't looking. Because it didn't help that most early PC games weren't really that good, as I guess is the case with most new platforms, at least back then. Well, then, yeah, you wouldn't buy a PC just to run games on it, it was very expensive. It might have cost like five or ten times more than an Atari. Nonetheless, IBM themselves introduced a game control adapter card. It's a bit of a mouthful, but I think that's its official name. Unfortunately, they didn't make a joystick for it. Also, it was expensive at upwards of $50, and as you might imagine, used one of the five ISA slots, which was all you had on the original 5150. And nothing was built into the motherboard other than really the keyboard port, so you needed those slots. And with this expense, most of the fact it took up a slot, the lack of support in titles, and controllers not actually been built for it yet, it goes without saying that this expansion card was not very popular. It was probably made worse later when IBM did introduce a consumer-oriented PC, the Junior, and as far as I'm aware, it used a different connector. I'm not actually clear on whether they made their own sticks for that, I think they did, but on the regular PC, you just had to make your own or adapt them from some other machine. Unlike the Atari interface, the IBM PC's game port used a 15-pin connector, and it wasn't as simple as merely doing a little rewiring to make existing controllers work, bar a small few. One of the major differentiating factors here is how the directions work. When you tilt a joystick on the Atari, it will pull one of the directional pins to ground. The same happens when you press the button. The 5 volt pin isn't really used with the standard CX stick, it's just a supply of power for presumably potentiometers in the paddle controller. As far as I know, I don't actually have the paddle controller or any game that supports it, and well, it's an Atari controller, so I can't imagine it's actually that good. I'm not really interested. 
Now on the PC, when you tilt a joystick, it adjusts a 100k potentiometer, which exists between 5 volts and just one pin. Aside from digital sticks that use fixed resistor values to emulate this same behavior electrically. Should be noted this is 100k potentiometer per axis. There are two. Generally, there probably are controllers with just one. But I'm not sure what you'd use them for. We're talking about joysticks primarily, and towards the upper left the resistance on both pots is lower, and towards the lower right the resistance is higher. It doesn't have to be exact, but it has to be quite close, and the centre of each axis should be as near as possible to 50 kilo ohms. If you're wondering, the system measures this using an RC network. It's an RC clock rather than, say, sampling the voltage or current directly. I, I think such a circuit would have probably been more complicated and expensive, and, well, doing it with an RC network is just about good enough. So, yeah, what we're doing, really, is just measuring the discharge time of a capacitor, which provides one of those great dilemmas to a programmer. Namely, how often do you check this? How often do you want to poll it? Because, well, doing that is actually quite CPU intensive. So, you don't want to do it too often, because the game is going to slow down. But on the other hand, you don't want to do it too little, because it will make the controls unresponsive and lumpy and rapid inputs might be missed entirely. With the single pin axes instead of the four pin setup, you'd think the PC would actually need less pins. But unlike the Atari, it supports four such axes and four buttons, albeit with a caveat. IBM intended this interface to be used with two sticks, each having two axes and two buttons. Still, arguably, even with the later, more elaborate controllers, the third and fourth buttons and axes are considered the second controller. This isn't really too important, they work the same way, electrically in any case, but quite clearly, very different to how the Atari controllers did things, with the only similarity being that the action buttons pull a pin to ground. It wouldn't be too hard to adapt an Atari stick to a PC, though, in principle, and could be achieved with a transistor or two and a handful of resistors. In, in fact, that's what the digital joystick that we've seen the innards of is doing. Really, the circuit in there is pretty much just converting the way an Atari stick works to a PC. I can't think why you'd want to use an Atari stick on a PC anyway, because the Atari sticks are crap, but well, you could totally do it. And maybe you would have had to back in the early 80s if you really wanted a game controller on a PC. As I say, IBM didn't make one, and it, it took everyone else a while to do it. I mean, we mentioned before, Gravis apparently made them, and I've never seen one. You, you just don't see game controllers for PCs from really the first half of the 80s. They, they don't seem to start being anywhere near abundant until the very end of the 80s, which sort of coincides with when sound cards started gaining ground, and I hate to sing creative praises, but you almost think the Sound Blaster might have something to do with this, as well as some I.O. cards that had started integrating game ports around then. In any case, I can't be the only one who has noticed that the majority of 15-pin joysticks are sort of from around 1988, and especially the 90s, like, really, most of them are 90s sticks and 90s gamepads. Now, over in the land of Sega, and back in the 80s again, the controllers were good and Atari-style ports were adopted, used on the Master System, and then expanded upon for the Sega Mega Drive. You might see an immediate problem, though, in that it's still a 9-pin port. It inherited quite a lot from the Atari controllers, to the point where you can actually plug a Mega Drive pad into a 2600, and it will work, but, well, uh, let's go through it, shall we? So... Pin 1 is up, pin 2 is down, pin 3 is left, pin 3 is right, pin 5 is 5 volts. That's the first one that's different to the Atari. Pin 6 is a button. Oh, okay. Pin 7 is select. Select. Yeah, okay. Pin 8 is ground. All right. Yeah, that, that's, that lines up. Pin 9 is another button. Well, that's only two buttons. Yeah, you might think I'm a dorky Nintendo idiot kid making mistakes and referring to start as select or some such, but even if we did, that's only three buttons and the pad has four. Plus select isn't a button. As it happens, start is actually on pin nine, along with C. A and B are both on pin six. Also, left and right are only left and right 50% of the time. Other times they're just null, whatever state they default to. High, I think. 
One could make a very simple adapter to get all four directions, along with button B and C, to work, which would actually sit in line with IBM's intentions of two axes and two buttons. But we want all four buttons to work. Inside the control pad is a Texas Instrument 74HC157 8 input, quad output, multiplexer. Oh, well, now it makes sense, doesn't it? When select is low, button A and start are wired to pin 6 and 9, respectively, but left and right aren't connected to anything, so we'll just we'll call it null, zero here, but again, I think they go high. Now, when select is driven high, left and right are connected, and they default to high, or, well, one, I guess. Uh, this is hurting my head. Well, let's just forget about the disconnected states. Uh, B and C are then connected to pin 6 and 9, respectively. All buttons will be high until pressed, then they pull their pin low through a resistor. Worth noting is how you might remember the Atari has pin 7 high, so you can probably figure out why the directions and button B work when you plug the controller into that system. I wouldn't do it the other way and plug an Atari controller into a Sega, it's just not a very good idea. But when we plug a Sega controller into an Atari, it's driving the select pin high. Up and down are always directly connected to pins 1 and 2, they're the only direct connections on the Mega Drive controller, at least on the three button pad, the, maybe the six button ones don't do it that way, I don't know very much about those. Now, multiplex is quite a big word, it seems intimidating, but it's actually not very complicated, and you likely know what it does. Essentially, it's taking two inputs and just putting them on one wire, by alternating the state of that select pin. You'd then have logic at the other side doing basically the opposite, acting as a demultiplexer, where it would alternate where to send the one input between two outputs, depending on the state of the select signal. The truth table or two in a data sheet might be helpful here. The multiplexer has an enable pin on it, but we can essentially ignore that here, as in this application it's just always enabled, but yeah, in some applications maybe not. And Well, to be honest, uh, when I said multiplexers and demultiplexers aren't complicated, that might have been a little bit of a white lie. It's really as complicated as you want it to be for a given application. In this particular application it's very, very simple, but yeah, you can imagine there are far more complicated systems than this that have a lot more lines been squashed down and a lot more single lines been, like, unsquished into lots more single ones. It, it can be quite a headache, but uh, for a control pad like this, no, it's actually really easy. Now, to get this controller to work on our IBM interface, we need to do a few things. Demultiplex the signals, latch outputs between line selects, invert some of the outputs, convert each axis to a single pin. There's actually a few ways we could achieve our aims. We could use a demultiplexer with latching outputs, which sounds great, and, well, there is a complementary part made by TI that, you know, you would put at the opposite end to the 157. We could do some things with flip-flops, and I did initially think about this, but we could also do some things with just plain latches. In any case, we'd need to generate a clock somehow and invert some outputs. As it happens, the 74LS75 quad input latches have both regular outputs and not outputs, which is to say each output has a complementary inverting output. That might be quite useful here, and in fact, these are what we're going to use, because believe it or not, it's going to save on chip counts. Latches do what they sound like they do, they latch. Here's a truth table for the LS75, and obviously we can see its pinout and everything in here too. As is surely evident here, the output will change to the state of the corresponding input, but only when the input is enabled. If the input becomes disabled, i.e. low, the latch maintains whatever the last state was, high or low, for a given output before the relevant input was disabled. It's latching. Also, the complementary outputs are always the inverse of the normal outputs, which is to say, they also latch, just in the opposite state. So, let's start with the clock. Initially, I used a 74LS86 as a kind of RC clock source and additional inverter for one of the inputs from the pad. Granted, as an exclusive auger, it wasn't really meant for this kind of job, and the clock was uh, a bit wonky. It did mostly work.
We could use a crystal, and one of the four pin oscillators would actually fit right into the chip socket that the L86 was in, and it would work. It's hard to find lower speed ones, though. They're also expensive now, quite often show up dead, and yeah, in the end I just went for a triple five timer IC. These are abundant, they're very cheap, and they have a ridiculous range of frequencies, all things considered. You can go from below one hertz to actually within the order of a couple of megahertz, although maybe they're not so great up there. Selecting a clock speed is actually a little bit tricky, because if you go too slow, the controls will start to feel lumpy and unresponsive, as well as maybe catching a bit of jitter between the latches changing state and the multiplexer changing state. That would probably cause a phantom input to be detected somewhere. If you go too fast, the ICs will just deadlock and produce weird noise and signals and crosstalk and... Actually, it's quite baffling what they will do. By all means, try driving them at a few megahertz and watch the whole thing just go haywire. Uh, on paper, a lot of what happens really shouldn't, so I actually don't fully understand what's going on. Now, for me, a clock between 150 hertz and 300 hertz seems about right. Really, you just want something that's faster than the frame rate your game's going to be running at, so there's no chance of detecting anything. It doesn't have to be 100% stable, and the duty cycle requirements are pretty lax too, but keep in mind each set of inputs will only be polled at half the clock rate, and if you have a ridiculously high or low duty cycle, it may be too short of an interval for one of the latches to work properly. Notably, we'll be driving each on opposite sides of the clock, which wants to be as square a pulse as you can get. But still, whatever your clock is, consider it half that clock for the amount that you're actually scanning the inputs. In my case, I've got about 300 hertz, so I'll be scanning things at about 150. If values for components used with a triple five have a lot of room to play with, so experiment or use an online calculator, though they're often not very accurate. Either way, my circuit uses a 104 capacitor, a 270 ohm resistor, and a 47k resistor, because it's what I had lying around in a bag. It probably isn't the best or most efficient way of doing things, but it's producing a really square clock with a near-perfect 50% duty cycle at around 300 hertz, and the signal's actually fairly strong. Stronger than the LS86 or a crystal oscillator. Oh, I use Zethcart build working clock circuits and shit, except when he does. I don't know how good this is going to be at Amiga VGA resolutions. It sounds quite nice, too. I'm going to build a synthesizer out of that. Quite square, I'm quite happy with it. Seems to work now. This pulse is output on pin 3 of the triple 5. That's the only pin from the triple 5 that will be connecting to anything else in the circuit, really, aside from power and ground, but we won't be sending it directly to any select or enable pins. Oh god, this is where it slowly starts to turn into a bit of a mild headache. Only a mild one, though, it's not a full blown migraine, it's not too bad. This LS75 is one of our latches. We will call this the right-hand latch. Pin 13 of this latch is the enable pin for inputs 1 and 2, and it needs to be pulled high at all times, in this case through a 4.7k resistor. You could technically omit this, but this seems to bang the transistors on in it very hard, and they don't really like it, so it just put the resistor in, or it'll be replacing that latch in short order. Now, this will keep those two inputs enabled constantly, as we won't be hooking these up to multiplex signals at all, and we're actually going to misuse them a little bit here, but the chip's not going to car. The clock is connected to pin 2 of this LS75, which is input 1. The relevant output of this is on pin 14, and we feed this back into pin 4. This enables input 3 and 4, which will be connected to multiplex signals. This means that those inputs are only read when our clock is high, as the signal from pin 14 is just a copy of that going into pin 2. Pin 1 is the complementary output of this, which means that that will go high when the clock is not high. We will send this to both enable pins on the left-hand LS75, as well as the controller select pin, pin 7. Using the latch outputs like this should help to avoid propagation delays between inverted and non-inverted clock pulses. There shouldn't be any phase shift going on, or it would be less pronounced. Also, it gives you a stronger clock signal, at least stronger than would have been coming out of like a, an RC clock or a crystal oscillator. Crystals have really weak pulses, so 
you would want to put it through something like this, even if you just feed it through a knot gate, just so you're running on the knot side of the clock with the 5 volt coming through a transistor. Now, as the clock runs, it should result in switching between both which latch is enabled, then which buttons are being connected from the pad. Our left hand latch handles A, B, left and right, while our right hand latch handles up, C, start and our clock. We'll connect up fast. Where is down in all of this? Well, down doesn't need inverting and it's always connected. So we just shove that over there for now. Up does need inverting and we have input 2 always enabled on that right hand LS75 latch. Hmm, so we can take advantage of that, send up to pin 3, that bin input 2. We can then take its complementary output, pin 12, to get the opposite of the state that up is in at all times. From here we need to take that pin 12 output of the latch to one of two clamps, in this case the one for the Y axis. This is actually pretty simple, in that it's a divider and a clamp, it's really not dissimilar to how the video bastardizer works, whereby we're making a digital thing into three possible analog levels. All we do is feed 5 volt through a 100k resistor, which alone would be the Y axis pushed all the way down. Then we feed down from the pad through a diode and 100k potentiometer, the 50k might work. These can be trim pots or full-blown potentiometers that you're sticking through the panel of a, a case for this thing, depending on how you want to do it. And we'll come back to the trimmers in a moment. The inverse up is fed through a diode, and now when we press up, the LS75's output on pin 12 will go high, essentially resulting in no resistance other than the diode being sent to pin 6 of the game port, which is the exit from the clamp, and the PC will see this as the Y axis being pushed fully up. If we press down, then pin 2 of the pad will go low, so now the only thing driving the game port is whatever of the 5 volts is coming through that 100k resistor. I think now you can see how this works. It's equivalent to the Y axis being pushed all the way down. Be mindful, up will still be high at this time, and as we're getting the inverse of that would in fact be low here. So if we didn't have that 100k resistor there, we'd be in trouble. We always have to have that 100k resistor in circuit, as otherwise the PC just thinks you unplug the joysticks. And to be honest, even with just a slight bias towards ground, it seems to think that. I mean, you might think the circuit can be made much more simple here, and it really should, and I tried and had no luck with that. My initial circuit for this was more simple and actually was more accurate, but the sound cards and such didn't like it. Oh, by the way, you might notice I didn't mention these uh, pull-up resistors. You might have to put those in or else there may be problems with the pad randomly vanishing from the PC's perspective, again depending what card you're plugging it into. I think it's because the latches are leaky, because it doesn't happen on the competing KYS product, which uses different ICs. Oh, and you can probably figure out the X-axis is much the same circuit as the Y-axis, but with both the lines from the gamepad connected to the left-hand latch, pin 3 of the pad goes to input 1 on left-hand latch, pin 2, Pin 4 of the pad goes to input 2 of the left hand latch, pin 3. We take pin 1 and pin 13 of that latch to another clamp divider thing, it's the exact same circuit, only this one goes out to pin 3 of the game port, that's the x-axis. You should again add these pull-up resistors really, you might need them. And of course we do have those trim pots in there, or full blown 100k pots. Yeah, that's for tuning your center point. They're basically the same as the little calibration trimmers that you see on the side of regular joysticks. Of course, on those, you're generally just offsetting where the potentiometer for the axis is. In ours, we're just emulating that behavior because, well, we don't have potentiometers to move in the controller, and our controller's digital, so, yeah, we, we just have to do it that way. You might have to tweak them occasionally, depending which PC it's in. The, the levels of things aren't the same from one system to another, necessarily. And, uh, yeah, the resistive qualities and conductive qualities and such of things. It could probably change depending on weather and humidity a little bit, but it's been fairly stable for me, all things considered. And now for the buttons. There's actually not that much left to do here. Attach pin 6 and pin 9 of the pad to pin 6 and pin 7 on both latches. Pin 8 and 9 of these latches Go to the button pins of the game port, pin 2, 7, 10 and 14. Pick your button order or add a switch to select it on the fly or a bunch of jumpers or whatever the hell you want. The left hand latch will have B on pin 9 and C on pin 8. The right hand will have A on pin 9 and start on pin 8. 
Goes without saying that 2, 7, 10 and 14 pins on the game port are in order, but 1, 2, 3, 4. You might have to add these pull-down resistors if you have problems, but you also might not have to. Depends on how leaky the latches are and how leaky the game port is and just whether it's in a bad mood. Likewise, you might want these diodes in line. You can probably leave these and the resistors out, but it maybe you expect to have to add them later if you do have problems with certain game ports. That really is it. Now we could use the unused latch outputs to drive LEDs as I've done, just so I can see what's going on. It kind of looks pretty nice actually. Of course you should test thoroughly for shorts and such and that your wiring's correct before plugging anything into anywhere else and even then I can't guarantee the circuit won't go haywire after a while and end up frying something. It shouldn't and on paper there's nothing wrong with it but I already killed one set of latches in this thing. I think they were faulty to begin with, given they were 30 year old salvages, and I don't know what sort of life they've had. Even at best, this thing is a bit of a bodge approach, but again, on paper, we're not running anything even close to outer spec. Also, I can't help but laugh at how we're using Ethernet cable to connect this to the game port, where we're actually coming out with less wires on a port that has more pins, which, I don't know, I just find that kind of amusing. I guess it's because the X's is just, well, two pins instead of four. Reading six button pads would require some additional steps, and those won't work properly with this adapter. You'd have to do things with counters and whatnot. There's not much point, as the game port has no facility for the extra buttons unless you wanted to hook them up to remain in two axes or something. It probably isn't very useful unless you perhaps planned to make your own software that could utilize it somehow. You'd still only be able to press one of the two buttons in each group at a time, using them that way, realistically. The competing KYS device I mentioned, uh, it can work with six button pads, and in fact those clamps for the axes were borrowed from that, because, well, when my initial circuit was trouble, despite being far more accurate as far as I could tell, uh, PCs didn't like it, and so to save me doing a bunch of calculations and testing and shit, I just borrowed these. I haven't tested Master System pads with my adapter, but I can think of numerous reasons they wouldn't work very well. You could maybe get away with them in games that only use two buttons. I'm not going to explain why, I'll leave it for you to figure out, it shouldn't be difficult. Atari sticks definitely won't work with this thing, and I really wouldn't recommend plugging them into it, to be honest, because it's... Uh, I don't know, I just don't recommend that. Still, you should now really be able to figure out how to make a circuit to use either of those controllers instead of a Mega Drive one if you wanted to. As, for the most part, it'd just be a really simplified version of what we've got going on here. Our actual circuit today is itself quite simple. No microcontrollers, no ROMs, though I guess you could use them as conditional logic. No RAM, unless you count the latches, no real anything but a few transistors in a convenient package, and a far few passive parts. I like to build things like this, but it seems that, sadly, it's a bit of a dying art form. These days, everything you look up is using some fancy MCU or full-blown ARM CPU to do the most simple tasks. It's always on a custom printed circuit board, in many cases you really don't need that sort of thing. People have their custom made project cases. Uh, you don't need it. A piece of good old fashioned strip board, some glue logic, a bit of patience, maybe a lot of that, tiny bit of ingenuity, it's all you really need to do a job like this. Oh, and an old VHS case, because I'm not paying for project cases are expensive and I can get VHS's of shitty movies compared with the, the case for pennies. There are no compatibility issues with revisions of ICs because, well, there's not running any code in this. There's no need for an external power supply. It all just runs off the game port. There's no need for programming or fancy tools. Anyone with the most basic soldering skills can really assemble a circuit like this one. It isn't even hard to design something like this. I mean, I did it. This circuit is entirely my own design, and I wouldn't say I was great at this sort of thing. It is simple enough that I'm fairly sure someone else must have built one at some point before that was probably near enough, if not entirely identical. Although, curiously, a lot of the schematics from the 90s tell you to hook it up to a parallel port, and I'm not actually sure why they did that. One curious thing, though, that this gives me an excuse to talk about is I can't really think of any other place I'll ever get to. 
is that the X port on the back of the Mega Drive is actually just a third controller port. I'm sure a lot of people have looked at it and sort of questioned whether it is, and well, yeah, it's it's just another controller port. It's a dressed like one. It's it is a controller port, and in fact, the controller ports, all three of them, have serial and parallel communication modes. I would imagine it must have used serial for the modem that plugged into it. But yeah, they're uh, they're quite versatile, really. I think they're a little bit underutilized overall, considering what you can do with them. I mean, I've used them in the past to dump CDs and cartridges and firmware and stuff like that, or upload code to the system, which, I mean, you only have 64k of RAM, but you can certainly bootstrap doing that from a, a very small ROM or a CD or something, and then have data uploaded through the, the controller ports, and you could use any of the three to do it. In any case, that's the circuit. We've seen it. We know what it does. There's not really much left to cover here, so I guess we should just go back to that dipshit in front of the camera. Oh, God. Well, there we go. Uh, as you can see, it's not a, an overly complicated circuit, and, well, you could employ this sort of thing... Uh, in quite a few scenarios, uh, you know, it's uh, it's pretty bread and butter logic, really, that we're doing here. Like, it's there's there's no specialised parts or anything, and that's the thing. I think this is becoming something of a lost art form. It's pretty annoying when you want to look stuff like this up, and you've got a bunch of quad core ARM CPUs and microcontrollers. Uh, maybe like, yeah, one of those may be a bit more passable if you were using like PIX or something, but. Uh, I don't know. I don't see, like, it amazes me how people just print off custom PCBs willy-nilly just to play with an idea. It's like, I know it's cheaper than it was, but you've got money to barn or something. And the tools you have to use, all these surface mount parts and programming knowledge. You don't need that to do something simple like this. And like, like I say, this is a dying art form. We just need a piece of strip board and some very simple glue logic and a timer I see. There's, there's not really much of anything going on here. Like, you know, it's, it's very simple. Anyone with basic soldering skills could probably put something like this together. It, it doesn't need to be particularly complicated. It's not doing a complicated job. In, in effect, all we've done is build a, a demultiplexer and, like, you know, a sort of DAC, I guess. Uh, you know, a, a clamp, and it's, yeah, it's not, it doesn't need to be, be overly complicated, we don't need all this shit, and it, it, it's, it's a shame people aren't doing this as much anymore, but whatever, we've done it, uh, you know, someone somewhere is probably going to build one of these, uh, I, I know lame guys built his own ones of these, I, he built one before me when I was still just toying with the idea, that could only use like two buttons and he's built another one that can do uh, six button pads I think you can only use four buttons of it because the the thing with the game port is you can only do four buttons but you know at least then I'm not the only person putting these things together and it, it would be nice if uh, to hear other people putting stuff like this together especially if you did your own design I mean sure draw from other designs if you need to might the clamp thing came from uh, Lame Guy's one because uh, originally I had something that was more biased towards ground. It, it didn't work on some sound cards. It was more accurate, but it was hit and miss whether it'd work. And so oh, I should go with a clamp and realized he'd already done it. So I just kind of borrowed the values. I don't need to faff about with calculators and stuff now. And, you know, I'd. By all means, just copy my design one to one. I'm not going to get upset by that. That's kind of why I'm showing you this now. Now you can build one of these yourself. Uh, it's, I'd say I don't know what it'd be useful for, but I, of course, I, it is useful for something because uh, I, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you play games on these old machines, and sometimes you don't want to use a keyboard to do it. Some games do handle better with a gamepad, and well, you might as well use one of the best gamepads out there to do it. And the Sega pad is a pretty damn good one. There are pads for the PC that are shaped like that, but the one I have has very strange button mapping, so I'm, yeah, I don't know that that's quite as good. It's like a weird bastard child of the, the Gravis pad and the Mega Drive pad or something. 
it, it works, but I haven't actually used it very much just because of the, the button mapping it has. I can probably rewire it, but you know, I'll just use a Mega Drive pad. It's better. Most games only do two buttons anyway, and the reasons for that I think are pretty obvious after what we discussed about the game pool. So, yeah, I, I don't think I have anything else to cover here. I honestly think I've gone over everything I had to fucking go over, so that's pretty nice. But yeah, yeah. I reckon we have. If we've got anything, I'll... Oh, you son of a whore! Well, if I've got anything, I'll cover it at the end, but uh, that's not fucking good. Now yeah, you see how fucking dark it is, at least I'm not going blind anymore. I'll discuss that a bit in the outro. i got things to say there anyway. And what, what we're doing next time depends if I can get certain things finished on time. Uh, there's a few things I could be doing. It, it just depends on schedules and what's available and, uh, and so on and so on. Anyways, uh, as always, don't be a screw-up. Love, Duff622. I'm I treason. Thanks for watching. Uh, blah, 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 whatever. <laughs> I'll see you around. This stupid light. I'm leaving this in. Let's see what's wrong with it. I just charged the battery. It took three days to charge. I don't know. We just got no power here at all. I don't smell burning at least. So, I mean, that's a positive. Well, the second outro is going to be dark, I'm afraid. I don't have another light. If it's not one thing, it's a fucking another, isn't it? So my light broke. And uh, my SD card broke. And my capture cards are broke. And I'm broke. I don't mind that though, because that's because I bought some stuff. So yeah, I'm trying to put some, uh, I decided I will build like another machine. This was something I always wanted to do. And, ah, fuck it, we'll just do it. Why not? So with any luck, we'll get to film that sometime. But as you can probably gather, yeah, it's getting harder and harder and fucking harder. So we're probably going to go to filming on phones, probably going to go back to composite capture. Uh, I can't film on the phone I've got right now because it only does VGA resolution and it uses that weird 3GP format, which I really didn't know was still a thing, but apparently so. I uh, don't begrudge this phone for it because it was quite cheap and it's actually didn't serve me really well. I don't like it, but you need one of these pocket slams now to get anything done. I hate how it won't fit in the sugar cube pocket, the watch pocket, right? My old phones, the old candy bar phones, used to fit in that because I mean, who has a pocket watch now? These things don't fit in there, so where am I supposed to put it? I can't put it in my ass pocket because I'll sit on it. I can't put it in my fucking crotch pocket because it'll fall out. And plus the fact I keep other things in there. You know, I can't fucking, oh, why'd I put it in my fucking knee pocket? But it's real hard to find jeans that have that now. And of course, there's every chance I'm going to end up kneeling on it. It's stupid. But that's how we do it now, apparently. You know, and so yeah, we're probably going to film on a phone, eventually. And uh, composite captures on the PC, because I... I'm kind of done with this. I'm probably just going to move this thing eventually and just use a desk for something else. Cause <laughs> at this point, with the operating system, uh, like updates and shit, performance is at a point where I am actually going to just be better off making my Presler stable and just editing on that. Because, I mean, I prefer being in Windows XP anyway. I don't like Windows XP, but I, I'm, I can get around it a lot faster than Windows 10 because the user interface is a bit better. It's not, not as good as like Windows 98 second edition but I, I can get around XP a lot quicker so maybe that's what we'll do because uh, yeah I, I just I'm sort of through with this and I don't want to stop making videos but the motivation goes away when I have to deal with just one thing after a fucking another it's just modern technology is just crap as we know we've discussed this before now where have I been well outside because uh, I managed to get on some stomach medication that worked really well, and I was sort of fuck staying in there, because I'm not an indoorsy person, I'm an outdoorsy person, I want to be out there, I don't want to be in here, so it's like, you know what, I actually feel alright now, I'm going outside, I'm going to spend my fucking summer out there, 
and you know I don't think there's a problem with that. If you've got a problem with it, you can get bent because uh, it's my channel. I do what the fuck I want, and this was always a side thing. I, I would much rather be out there. Unfortunately, I had to come off the medication, so yeah, now it's going to end pretty badly at some point. Um, I'll fight it every step of the fucking way. And I'm determined I'll win, but I can't see how I'm going to do that yet. And so it might get a bit nasty, which sucks. But we'll see where it goes. Anyways, yeah, uh, as I say, I will. We do have more videos to do. It's just doing them isn't very easy right now. Need to replace the camera. Uh, need to come up with a capture setup. Need to come up with a machine for editing. <laughs> Basically, we've got nothing, and uh, the SD card I'm on is my very last one, and it's stuck in the camera, so... Yeah, I'm just going to have to tar that out of there, probably break the slots are already broken, but I have a second slot, so my plan is to jam it in there, and I can at least do things in the meantime. And uh, lesson learned, don't buy expensive SD cards, don't buy the high-grade ones, buy the cheap ones, because the expensive ones, they seem to die just as fast. And maze is still a problem. The early SD cards were fucking slow, and they just stayed slow forever. These new ones, it doesn't matter how good they are, they'll work really well, but with every subsequent write operation, like, uh, you know, you'll write to it and fill it up, and then you'll erase it, and you'll write over it again, and it gets slower. And I think, you know, you're lucky if you can get 10 write cycles out of them before they get stupidly slow, and then they just vanish from the machine, stop working. So, yeah, where's the money? Just buy the fucking cheap ones. Buy micro SD ones and stick them in an adapter, at least then you can put them in more devices and they'll overheat and they'll burn out, but <laughs> they don't cost as much, so hey, you know, you might as well, especially what the full size ones are at this point. So there you go, that's a bit of consumer advice for you. Anyways, uh, I'm High Treason, thanks for watching. Uh, I'm, I will be back, don't know when, never know when, because, well, we've just been over that, so yeah, I'm going to get out of here. I really appreciate you watching this, you know, it's... Uh, always do, because I, I don't make this shit with the expectation that anyone's going to watch it. I sort of figure somebody's going to at this point, but, you know, I, I do this for fun, and that's maybe why you haven't seen me as much, because <laughs> a lot of the time it ain't fun anymore. If I'm not having fun, I'm not doing it. I'll just stop until it is fun, or I'll, I'll ditch it and do something else that's fun. That's just the way it is. That's how it always was. For fuck's sake, man, I, I, my handle's not even High Treason, it's fucking Zeph. High Treason was a character I invented, it was just a fucking jerk when I was in college, you know. So, <laughs> uh, it's one of those where you're like, oh, should I change it? No, nah, we'll just leave it as this, because that's what everyone knows now, but... Hmm, yeah, it's weird, there's probably some alternate timeline where I, I didn't do that. And, yeah, who knows? Anyways, I'm out of here before something else breaks, I can feel it in my bones. Or maybe that's just my blood been full of uh, acid. I don't know. Not the drug acid, the actual acid acid. Right, yeah, whatever. Oh, this lighting's shite. It was better than nothing.